Let's start it from there. All right. Let's, what's up, Andrew? Are you ready to start our, our first fucking episode? I'm willing to crack into it here. Our first episode uh, is with uh, somebody that we all grew up absolutely adoring because he was so kind and soft spoken. Um, and, uh, you know, he just, he lived for snowboarding and only snowboarding. He never talked once. He yeah. wasn't opinionated in any no, way, shape no or form. At all. Yeah. And he had a really hard time getting sponsors because he was not very marketable. Willie, um, I hate the term legend because it's overused. And I believe there's really only about enough to count on two hands in the snowboarding industry that could actually use that word. And it also, it, it, it puts people away. When you say legend, it, it says, oh, well, he used to be something. He isn't anymore. Well, yeah. this yeah. interview is with uh, somebody who I would consider one of my, you know, s the seven legends that exist in snowboarding to this day. And the male snowboarder of the year, George! Kevin Jones. I want to thank Metallica because they're sitting right over there. You didn't want a second chance. Is that exactly where you are? Damn it. We lost another one. What the fuck, man? I'm protecting myself. I feel like I haven't seen your face in like 12 years or something. Well, you're not going to see it for the next hour and a half either. <laughs> there's no myself. There's no I data mean, that says you can't get Rona through a microphone. Are you uh yeah, I haven't. I trust the science, and science does hasn't figured out that we can't get it through microphones yet, or through the and especially that Canadian strain. It's bad. Oh, it's heavy up there. Yeah, all you can smell is maple syrup. That's what's up with that flamingo on your climbing wall? Is that like one of the grits? That's how I get my two-year-old to get up the wall. Put a little flamingo up there and. Next thing you know, he gets up there. That's I, guess, I guess we should introduce our guest for those of you who don't know who's behind the mask and who was in that video, who's not maybe watching this. They're listening to it. It is a podcast after all. This is the one and only Kevin Jones, a.k.a. KJ. What, what are some other also just, known as this? Uh, the Cage. That's the, it's a popular one. I think I stole this from you, Kevin. You probably did. I don't know how I ended up with this, but how much uh, how much money did you make off of this? Do you remember? I have no idea. That's the irony. In theory, you made a bunch of money, but like it looks good on paper, sort of a deal. But collecting that money is is a whole different a whole different ball game. Or saving it, or holding on to it. Yes. What were we looking at there? It's like a, you know, like the action figure. Well, it's like the snowboard. Let me try to get it out of this way. This way. It's also That's right. ingenious because you can actually place keys on it. It's actually a keychain. So they, they combine two things at once. It's genius. It says here that your your hobbies include fly fishing, golf, and playing my bass. Um, I don't do uh, any of those except for play my bass now. You know, uh, were you in the golf at one point? I don't think my hobby was golf. I don't... Yeah, that's funny. That was a, that was surprising. I, I figured you'd be like fuck, like anti golf or something. That was probably like wishful thinking on Steve Aspen's part that I would like go golfing all the time with him. 
Well, so which they, I did for a little bit. So maybe it was during that one time that I did it, golf with him. It's pretty sick though, because you share the back of this card with Danny Way, uh, Ryan Nyquist. I don't know who that is, and He's Greg a and Greg Greg Nelson, who's a wakeboarder. Oh yeah, and Glenn and Glenn Flake. That's that's a legendary crew there. Let's talk about the fact that you came up with the name for this podcast for us. Let's talk about the fact that Glenn Flake had that sick mohawk and probably still does for he so still long. does no he straight up still does i mean you, you were throwing around that legend term that dude's like that's heavy very yeah. legendary yeah like he, he's probably like skin on some skin track in the middle of nevada as we speak right now just killing it yeah do we do we ever wonder though like how much is a hairdo your identity and the fact that it's he's held on to it for so long what if he wasn't a hairdo would we know who he is I mean, I, I don't think you recognize But him. who cares? Because he has the hairdo. True. True. I mean... He has to have the hairdo. You, I mean, it's like when Kiss took off the makeup. Were they still Kiss? No. No, like Kiss they weren't. Sucked. I mean, they sucked either way, but they sucked <laughs> real bad when they took the makeup off. Right? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he, he still exists as a persona with makeup off. Uh, and he still had his sex list. I'm so lost on the sex list. Yeah, I think he, I think, he, I remember watching that show when I was a youngster because I love Shannon Tweed. She appeared in more movies than uh, his wife at the time. She appeared in more movies than Tom Hanks and she showed her boobies in all of them. So obviously I was a big fan. Um, so I watched the show and he had slept with over 4,000 women in his life that he was keeping like tally. Um... Yeah, what, what's his name? Um, Gene Simmons? Gene Simmons. Well, I thought you were talking about Plague. <laughs> I thought we were talking about Plague this whole time. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, Plague's probably up there, too. I mean, come on. Okay, let's get let's get to it. Enough fucking shenanigans. I mean, you can edit that out, right? You can do whatever we, we want. We can edit anything out, dude. I could make it look like we're interviewing fucking... I don't know. Glenn Plague. Glenn Plague right now. Well, and it's good to include Glenn. Why not? You know, this it doesn't always have to be snowboarding this and snowboard that. We we're we're above thing and our guest is above and beyond snowboarding today. So we can talk about climbing and how how about all this like like inclusiveness for snowboarding? Like, you know how Seems like a lot of people are like, let every like everyone should be introduced to snowboarding. Like, how do you feel about that, Kevin? Like, do you want more people to start snowboarding, or do you wish that everyone would like stay the fuck out of the backcountry? <laughs> well, I mean, personally, I would rather everybody stay out of the backcountry. I mean, but reality is that that's not going to happen. They're already the there. Thing about it, snowboarding was, it was never. I mean, did you ever like? Some dude walked up and he was a different color skin than you, and you were like totally vibed him, like I don't live flying, bro. I mean, we never vibed any, but that's what snowboarding was. It was inclusive. It didn't matter if you were fat or if you like did crank or if you like couldn't see, or it was just like yeah. if, if you were a bummer on the whole scene, if you were a complainer, or if you were totally reckless and we had to drag you out of like. Then you got vibe and you weren't were in the scene, but pretty much the only prerequisite to be a snowboarder ever, at least in the scene that I was in and the scenes that my bros were in, were you just had to be kind of cool and like be stoked on snowboarding. So I don't like this whole like inclusiveness thing, unless something's changed in the, this generation that I, I, I've never seen, I, there, there was no not including everybody. If you wanted yeah. to come snowboard, we're coming right. snowboard. Uh, I was like that up in Canada too. If anything, you just reminded me we needed more friends. We would have taken anybody. Yeah. If there were yeah. transsexuals back then, we I would have had a whole posse of transsexuals. You probably would have been racist then because you only would have snowboarded with transsexuals. Yeah, I would have been yeah. like if you're if you're not trans, LGQ, 
Yeah, but we wanted to have more friends. I wanted more people to wave at. I mean, you could you could know your friends based on the pants that people wore in in your small little resort town. So I would agree with you, Kevin, in the sense maybe these people who are trying to find an issue with snowboarding are yeah. from big metropolis cities where uh, they're experiencing a totally different world than the real snowboard community experience or at least that the past one I, I think that i think that there's no maybe about it i think that they're just trying to find something and anything so they could make a instagram post over something that in, in my opinion doesn't even exist it's like the only prerequisite is to be cool to go snowboarding yeah exactly like, and cool i mean in that sense of the word I mean, cool like just don't be an asshole yeah, and cool, like actually want to be a snowboarder, not just want to stand around and. Yeah, I mean, yeah, don't be lazy. Wear snowboarding. Let's just say Jackson Hole, for example, and you're like, well, I want to go to the Million Dollar Cowboy Bar. I'm going to go to the, this spa. And I'm going to ride the hot air balloon. I'm going to ride the tram. I'm going to go fly fishing, and I'm going to go snowboarding. Like you have a checklist. Mm. It's not like you're sleeping in homie's garage and it's minus twenty out, and you know. Like your your whole life is, I think is what you're saying. Your whole life is centers around snowboarding. You think about snowboarding in the summer. You're working your balls off so you can afford a pass for the next year. It's that in that sense, yeah. There's a huge difference in in snowboarding I, culture and just snowboarding. These days, there aren't a lot of well-rounded riders that could be considered, uh, you know good at everything you used to be connected to the competition world uh used to slay in almost every aspect of freestyle including rails and slope style and i even saw you playing around in a half pipe once in a while you go and you take that same amount of dedication to the backcountry which i you know we used to be able to watch you do everything and it wasn't just to fill your video part with diversity it was because that's what you were into so maybe speak to that a little bit uh, basically like the, the you first in the first time you asked a question it was about the contest scene and the contest scene was a way to make money so you could go on these trips that you wanted to do because i don't know if you i'm sure you guys remember this but contests were not cool for the longest time like i remember blatantly that jamie lynn wasn't competing in like this contest or that contest or terry was boycotting olympics and I mean, we had this like contest thing where we didn't want to be part of the of that jock one up. Uh, I'm better than you culture. That wasn't what our sport was. Our sport was about out there having fun. That was it, and and progressing it at a, a pretty mind blowing pace. But that was what it was about: was progressing the sport, not competing with our peers. We all knew who was better or or best, or, even if you can say that. It was all like the community was so small. We knew that. We didn't need to go compete for it. But that little thing they dangled over you was this money. And then all of a sudden, if you say you win a contest, you got five grand in your pocket. You can live off that for the winner. So that was the motivation to to do the contest. And then when the prize money got huge, then next thing you know, you can win a contest and go to Alaska for a month. So that yeah. was always about making more money to go on cooler trips and yeah. and i understand that but you the way you sometimes rode in rail contests for instance where just about every other rider would just give up on these weird demented rails that they were building for a few years there i remember one specifically was the the sims event in whistler and it was like this twisty twirly sidesy widesy kicker rail that had everything and nobody, everyone just gave up and you just kept riding. You already won, Kevin. <laughs> and you just kept riding it. So that would completely contradict what you're saying. Is it just being about money? However, you did mention it was also about fun. So why did you just keep going when that thing could have taken your knee out? Well, probably because it was fun or, I mean, yeah. Well, what else are you going to do? I mean, the bar is going to be there when you get done. Uh, it snowboard. It was whatever was in front of you. It wasn't. It, I, well, I grew up watching, you know, like Selaznik in the park, Selaznik on a pad, a Squaw Valley, and, and watching all these, you know, and then watching Tom Burke go down the fingers. And my mentors were a lot of the, the Hatchet brothers 
for the guys that mentored me in the backcountry and taught me how to not kill myself. And then, but then I would go to Boreal and I have like, you know, these, this other whole group that just did jibs or so it, it and it's not powder every day. So what are you going to do? Just sit around and bitch that there's no powder. Are you going to just going to go ride a rail or are you going to go, I don't know, make a jump, ride a tree. It was These just days, yes. They would bitch that there's no powder. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't care to bitch. It was just like, well, let's just go snowboarding anyway. Like back then, it was. I just didn't care. It was. I just wanted to go snowboarding every day that I could. But Let, let's go. Let's go back just a tiny bit because something I'm interested in is like it seems like you kind of came came out of nowhere. Was there like this long buildup, like everybody else, where it's like the fucking shop sponsor, the rep sponsor. It, it just seems like you were fucking ripping right out the gate. And like, it happened quick. Like from when you started snowboarding till the time you were like getting paid and traveling, how how long of a period was that? Well, it was like a year. <laughs> yeah, see, that's Years. what I'm saying. Years. I just grew up skateboarding. I took that same mentality from skateboarding. It was just like, until you can't like move anymore. I, I just skateboarded my my whole youth pretty much obsessively, and then I got into this band, and then I we were starting to play clubs like in Sacramento when I was like underage and going to bars. I'm like, this is kind of cool, and then still kind of snow like snowboarding, but not really committing to it, not thinking that there's any chance that some idiot like me would be sponsored and back then we didn't even really know what's being sponsored i mean you got a free board cool but it wasn't even about that it was like whatever like this band is really cool and we're and we're making money and um and then our drummer od and died so i kind of like had this come to jesus moment where i was like okay i have this healthy lifestyle that i can pursue and i don't have to depend on any bandmates or I can go down this kind of this road that I was kind of seeing, like the, the drugs and the booze and the like crazy nights out. And then, and I was just like, moved to Truckee. Uh, at the time I, I traded my base for a snowboard and, and just dedicated myself a hundred percent to snowboarding, not knowing that there was going to be any sort of financial outcome. It was just more or less like, I, I really need to see where this goes and how far I can take it because in the beginning I thought snowboarding was pretty stupid. Like they all had these like neon green suits on and like mambo socks and, and like trying to skateboard on the snow. I was like, this is totally gay. Like what is this? What are you guys trying to do? And then I was watching that movie Riders on the Storm. I'm sure you guys remember that one. And I saw Cardion Selaznik in it. I was like, wait a minute. If those dudes are doing it, it's got to be super cool because those guys were like my heroes, like going to the Grind Skate Park in Sacramento and RDL, Salaz would come in and you could hear them when they came in, dude, and, and like Jeff Tolan and you would hear it would just be like, like the coping would just begin smashing, like, oh, the boys, it gives me chills, like the boys are there. And then you look around the corner into the street course, like I'd be skating the mini ramp and you just see like lightning speed and just like breaking board, just tail smacks and like, just like the, just the audio alone, I knew that they were there. And so I saw those dudes snowboarding and I'm like, well, I gotta go try this like for real. So I went up and like tweaked my stance and made it look exactly like their boards. And, and, and I'm like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. So once the, that Cardiel and Salaz deemed it cool in my head, like if those dudes do it, then that's that's a, a hall pass to go try this super lame sport. So that's how that whole thing started. Was there ever like a time when you were like done with competition? I'm going hardcore backcountry. I'm just gonna film. Uh, that clips. was like it was a battle like every year because it came to the point where it was in my contracts that it would have to be the contest. And I'd get like heat from like the Hatchet Brothers being like, dude, you gotta like stick around and we'll film like a really good part. And you gotta, you know, and then then you'd have to have time to train for these train, whatever you want to call it, for these contests that are usually like in January. And you only get a couple weeks to ride. And then how many film days you get a year? How many bluebirds stable powder days do you get in the backcountry every year? Like mm -hmm. and lucky. 
uh, there was a constant battle of of making people happy with these stupid contests and trying to get enough days in the backcountry to film a part because it definitely wasn't like it is today where you had like you could film something with your phone or you know it just was a whole different deal back then with 16 millimeter cameras and you know yeah, you were limited shot. you're limited to crews that knew what they were doing with 60 mil for sure well you, you had, had to be you had to be ripping too for anyone to burn fucking 16 mil on you 20 bucks a shot yeah every fall was 20 dollars <laughs> like whoa when hatchet told me that i was like okay pressure's on don't fall <laughs> weren't you uh weren't you like pretty hung over winning all those x games weren't you telling me that like you uh you kind of buckled at x games once because you were you weren't hung over and then your team manager was like you're never competing not hung over again no it was astafin he, he, he would always go out there with me and and uh he was pretty pretty on it pretty ahead of his time in the whole like uh that side of it you know what's what's that what's that dude like tyson's dude king or whatever his name is yeah Don the dude king. with the hair Don yeah, king. Yeah. He was yeah. kind of the dog. He was ahead of his time on Mark. Like he saw the vision of all that when we were all just polarized on like I want to learn a new trick and go right pal. He was, he kind of saw the dollar signs on on that side of it. So explain yeah. who that is to the listeners because I don't think they know that. And and let me just quickly add: we're you must be one of the first agented riders in snowboarding. Is that correct? Uh, I I I don't know that for a fact, but I know that. We pretty much started the first agency with the family, uh, with Steve Asif, and it was. And the first dudes were like you see myself, and I think Todd Richards was on there. Um, but it was just started basically because my mail. I would get home and I'd have like a stack of mail, my bills, and I'm like, I can't do both. I'm tired of paying late fees, basically. And we started talking. And he's like, Well, I'll do that for you. And I'm like, Okay, can you deposit my checks too? He's like, How about I? try to make you some money too while I'm at it. So, and he was in between jobs. So, hmm. or actually I think he was at the time, a team manager at Lamar. And then he kind of was doing the thing for me on the side. And then he saw the vision of materializing it into this huge thing. And, and is that kind of when these big deals started to get thrown on the table? Is like after that, like after you kind of teamed up with him? Yeah, I think it was just a perfect storm. I think the sport was there and I think he was there and, and I, you're, you're never going to be as good as somebody going and fighting for you in a room. I mean, yeah. what do you do? You go, go, dude, I'm so sick. I'm worth, I'm worth like twice that money you just offered me. Like, check me out. Haven't you seen me? I mean, you're never going to be able to promote yourself like that. Like somebody else can go in there and be like, nope. Because I'm going to go, they're going to go 30 grand. I'm going to be like, that sounds great. Okay. Get me out of here. I'm going to the, the ball. So what was like, like what was the what was the first like huge deal that you signed? Uh, I don't. I think the biggest one I ever signed was my first Lamar contract because it was. I, I don't remember exactly. I think it was like fifteen hundred bucks a month, and I was just like, "Booyah!" No rent. No, like my car payment was paid for, my rent was paid more paid for, and I could snowboard every day. What year was that? Probably ninety. Five ish. So that was like that was when Lamar was fucking tight. Like Lamar it was, was like, uh, it was Pencil, like Rankwit, Rankwit, uh, yeah. Gilligan, Yoder, uh, Yoder. Was Cardiel uh, on there? Cardiel. Yeah. Cardiel. Yeah. Imagine that dream comes true. So, so what? Were you like the youngest kid on that I, team at the time? What's that? Were you the youngest kid on the team at that time? Probably. The youngest kid at, at, on the team at that time? I think so, yeah. I was I was probably 20. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, being on the, I, I went from like idolizing Cardiel to being a larger than life, like like a god base. I mean, there was nobody big like I didn't follow sports. It wasn't like Jordan and and uh, I don't even know like Steve <laughs> you can't even name any of these that guys. was snowboarding though back then right it found it found kids who didn't want to play uh, group sports like that it found the loners 
It totally did. It found the, the, the odd guys out, the maybe the introverts and the, you know, and it, it happened to happen in these places that are super freaking awesome. I mean, you go up in the mountains and just trip out and get rad. <laughs> so you were like, were you doing trips with like Cardiel and Ranquit and all these guys back then? Uh, Ranquit kind of already had his whole, his crew kind of set up. Like I was the new kid. I wasn't just, you didn't just get to go with those guys. It was different yeah. back then. It wasn't the Burton team where, you know, you're, you're taking the, the kid on the trip with you. They already had their own scene. I had to fight for what I got. Like, yeah. They were probably pissed, you know. It wasn't, it was still old school rules back then. I didn't, they didn't like take me to their jumps and be like, hey, dude. Yeah. Fuck it was like, yeah, whatever. Like new kid, see how long you last. Good luck. And then yeah. how long were you on Lamar? Till probably 2000, I think. So somewhere around there, probably six or seven years. And then is that when the whole genius thing happened? Yeah, pretty much. Yep, and then the genius thing happened. Um, the Lamar thing got weird because they sold it. And that dude, Jamie, bought it. And he, to quote him, he called me a spoiled fucking brat. Well, they, they bought the, the story on that is they bought the company and the, the company was sold without the athletes being an asset. So yeah. And we slowly, uh, you know, have that in there because if, if you buy it with the companies as an asset, I mean, that then we're, it's like that, that's going to change the price of the whole company, right? Yeah. If you get all the marketing team with, the, I mean, it's sold separately. Yeah. But he got, got me up there, flew me up to Vancouver. And so, and I, I walk in, you know, all thinking I'm bad and I'm like, Hey, screw you, man. I'm not writing for you. You're a jerk, you know? And he, he just looks at me and says what I just said. And he said, I'll tie you up in court for the next eight years. He goes, you don't have any, what are you going to do? Just show up to court every day. He's like, and then I'll appeal. I said, I'll lock you up for as long and you won't be making any money here. I'll double your salary. Stay with me for two years and I'll let you go. And I, I pulled him the F off and walked out the door and went and uh, talked to my people. And they said, yeah, he can tie you up for as long as for a long time. It's like, if you want to fight it, fight it. If not, it's probably easier just to take the two years and, and just. Uh, so you had to ride for him after he, for two years after you fucking hated this guy? Yeah. And he made skateboards with my name on it. He made like boots with my name on it. He just like fully horror, like totally hoarded the whole deal out it was embarrassing wasn't he kind of the, wasn't he kind of the first guy that like decided that like pro snowboarders were obsolete like he didn't need a team or anything he could just sell these like because he came from ride right yeah and, like, isn't that why ride went under is because he was like gray marketing boards and shit like he did some yeah, fucked totally. up shit and he like, got barred from snowboarding for a couple of years, and then he did the same thing in windsurfing. He got barred from windsurf. Like, how do you get barred? Like, your your, your business ethic is so lame yeah. that you get barred from the industry for two years by law. Yeah. And then this is the dude I'm going into the going into a conference with. You know, some twenty. I'm like 25 years old snowboarder dude, just thinking I'm I'm awesome against this dude. <laughs> He's just a parasite. Then he comes in. He yeah. has no soul, and he just strips it. He's basically. Yeah. Buy, chop up, and sell. Who gives a shit? Who it hurts in the process? And exactly. uh, you know that's that's like that's like the American way these days. Though. So <laughs> yeah, fucking, I think everybody's looking to do that. All these little, I want to show off. I want to flex. How can I do that? And it's the wrong attitude. And I think that's why we always are comparing today to the yesteryears. You know? Yeah. Give it's us a perfect. story about fucking. Fucking with the industry, Kevin, because those are always my favorite. There's got to be one in the top of your head where you just say, "Nope, I'll do it my way." <laughs> uh, there was there was kind of a like an urban legend that that I threw a helmet at the at this dude. Oh, there, there's two of them. I threw a beer can one time, and I threw my helmet. X Games the night before this contest, right? They, we had this writer meeting, and they said, "Well, you gotta you gotta wear a helmet." They go, it's mandatory. Everybody has to wear helmets tomorrow. And I'm like, we don't. And my, my thing was, it wasn't that I didn't, I wasn't into safety. It was like, you can't, if you're not used to riding a helmet, you're going to go ride some icy flat piece of crap kicker 
and you're going to wait till the sun goes down and shades up everything, ices it over, and you have it's going to be like half snowing, and then you're going to make us wear a helmet. It's like the only way that you can hear your speed is like if you put a helmet on, it changes your whole, you know, judging your speed is from your, a lot of it's sound, right? Absolutely. And I'm like, you can't just pull that on us the night before. They're like, well, it's Android. Don't compete. And I just got all, you know, same deal. Just, oh, we don't need you. We'll just we'll get another rider in here. And so I threw a helmet. So that was kind of a, a story that turned into kind of. You bad boy. It's whatever. And then I got, I was at Bachelor one time and, and uh, the judge, uh, one of them who will remain nameless because whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> he decided that I, I landed my trick and it was just to get into the finals and, and they, they like x me out by like one point, right? And it was mm -hmm. one of those things that wasn't even, it was it was not even close, you know? Nobody, mm -hmm. like half the people land. I think Autostrom like, did something super sick, but that was like the only thing that was, that was even landed. And, uh, and, and I had just flown up there from like Tahoe and it was like just for the day for the contest and blah, blah, blah. Long story long, they, they didn't even let me in the finals. And I, I opened a Coors Light and threw it at him and it almost hit the dude in the head. So <laughs> I got, well, that sounds I, fair. I just, I could not handle the, the, there was so much bullshit back then. There was so much little, like, you had these pros that didn't make it, and they, they had this, like, chip on their shoulder, and they hated everybody that was kind of doing well. And then you had all these industry maggots, parasites, like Willie said, that just, they would come in and act like they're your bros, and then behind closed doors, they're, like, doing these deals and screwing you out of, like, $500 here. And, five, and you're just like, you know what? Screw all these people. Like, you guys are, like, you guys are like, like the opposite of what this whole thing's all about. And I did like that, that war on me like miserably, like it ruined a lot of that ruined what snowboarding was for me, like the whole business side and the, and the, and the shit talking and all that. It's like, it's snowboarding people like get over it. It's not the wall street. You want to go work and make money. You want to like make millions, go work somewhere else. Get the, get out of our scene. Like you, we don't, yeah. you don't belong here. You didn't then and you don't belong here now. It, well, when, it, when talentless people uh, see money is what yeah. it is. They come in and there's this industry that started itself essentially uh, and, and, and grew from the creativity completely naturally. And then cha-ching, you see the, the money signs and uh, in they come. Just a bunch yeah. of dipshits, right? And, and, and I can see why you get jaded at that. And especially like the golden goose, like someone who's crushing shit, you know, like those people are the biggest like uh, targets, you know what I mean? Like if you're fucking dominating contests and I don't know, they just they just see you as like a fucking cash cow for them. And it's like unless you won't do what they say and then you're going to get jaded because they're going to work against you which it sounds like it happens because i mean did you have a good relationship with all of your sponsors kevin for the most part yeah the sponsors that were cool like the in the in industry besides lamar uh the genius thing got a little weird just because but for the most part the in industry people were pretty cool you know the, the bindings the boots the goggles the they were pretty cool, pretty reasonable. Um, any of that out of industry stuff was just kind of retarded, and I, that's why I, 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 did, I didn't have the stomach to deal with it. And then towards the end, it got toward well, towards the end of the like the big money years. Even the in the in industry stuff just was getting so sideways, and people were so geeked on dollars, man. They were so geeked on making their little dollar signs. And then, you know, they'd say, oh, we don't have a budget for you to go to, you know, wherever, to go to France and ride the, I don't know, like the Dolomites or some, some trip that would be rad. But then the next week, they have you fly down to Southern California. You're sitting around a sushi dinner, a $5,000 freaking dinner. And you're just like, so you don't have no, you don't have any money to do anything cool, but you have money to, like, just to throw, it just, the whole thing baffled me. 
It wasn't so, about so I'm interested then, um, you knowing this and you knew this, you, you still got into genius. You thought it was going to be different, right? Can you just give us a quick walk through in a nutshell of the whole genius startup and, uh, what ended up happening? Cause it looked like it was going to be just so cool. I remember when it was just hatching. It was cool for three years and it was Peter's Peter line called me up and he said, Hey, I want to start a company. Let's do it. And at the time, I was starting Capita with Blue, Jason Brown, and Jeffy Anderson. And at that same time, Sims was peppering me pretty hard with a huge contract, like over a million. And I was like, man, I really want to do something really cool. And the, and the Capita thing, you think Capita now, and you, you would have no idea, but I was like, I don't know, dude, it sounds a little sketchy. But the infrastructure was already in place with Genius. There was going to be no startup and the, and the business you know they already had the manufacturer they already had the marketing they already like everything was there it was just like you you put one little pile of chips over in genius and it was going to be good right whereas capital was a lot more work um it was like and, more of a concept kind of and the sims and the sims thing sims wasn't they were kind of rebuilding and the money was great you know in hindsight probably should have just taken the money but it wasn't like my heart wasn't into it. So Genius was something, and it was with Peter Line, a guy I really looked up to. And and then in the in, and then the contract was signed, and then we, we did all that stuff. And then Peter dropped out because I didn't want to believe for him. It was probably a ploy to get me to over to Genius, I'm I'm believing, but whatever. It was still cool. And at the time I was dating Tara, so of course then they wanted me to get Tara involved. So I think there was some mental manipulation going on there, but it's neither here nor there. Um, it, that part of it worked out well, and then it, w- it went good for three years, and we were making money. Was the was the the weird part? Because hard goods don't make money in that short amount of time, as everybody knows. And then the deal got all shady. They sold Forum to Burton, and a year later, they just dropped Genius, basically. So I basically had no say in the sale, any of that. I, I wasn't a majority shareholder, and. I got a check, which was cool to get a check. Um, for what was your stake? Hours. What was your stake of genius? I always so wondered that. It was just done. It was just all of a sudden it was just over. Like you put all these ideas into it, and, and you think that this is something like that's going to last for 10, 15, for you know, forever. And it just it had the capacity to do that, and that was the most disheartening part about it was. It just got burnt and bought it and it just went nowhere. It just they didn't just, have a meeting, they didn't say, Hey, can we make something out of this? What do you think? No, there was no offer like, Hey, you want to buy it? There was no nothing. It was just what, here's a check. What was your stake in it? It was somewhere between uh 20% and 50, 50 tw- somewhere between 20 and 51. Ah. So you think you'd be a part of that conversation? That seems just ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was shady. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure somebody at Forum made a lot of money. Ah, another one of those. Yeah. And so, do you regret leaving Capita? Like in hindsight, were you like, you know, or was that just a grind? You you were glad to get away from. No, I mean the. The romance of it, yeah, and, and to see where they are now, yeah. I mean, of course, you have a little bit of of. Uh, it's not remorse. It's not. It's none of that. And I'm super stoked on where those guys are at. Mm. But at the time, that was just the better decision for me. You know, it just, I, I mean, it was like heart wrenching to to bail on those guys. But mm. it just at the time, that's what it, it was a better deal for me. Okay. Well, yeah, you, you had more. You had more, more of a say. You had more of a say in, G- in Genius, though, you know, right? Like, like Genius was kind of your company in a way. I mean, that's how I saw it. Me too. Well, it was a lot. It, it was a lot. Like, Peter had a lot to do with that. Like, a lot of the, the concepts and a lot of the direction was was him. And then they kind of bounced it off me. But it was a lot of – it was marketed a lot around me. Yeah. And to be honest, yeah. I didn't have a whole lot of time to be spending doing a whole lot of that. So it worked out very well. And that's where the capita thing wasn't going to, I was like, I don't, I don't have time to do, 
to be looking at every little thing, you know, and to figure out what, what manufacturer we're going to be at. And, and I didn't, I really didn't want to take on, I don't think at that time, that burden of all that, because I was still just hundred percent into snowboarding. And yeah, you couldn't do both. The liberty of just being a snowboarder. And I wasn't ready to be a businessman yet. I loved the genius marketing though. I was like, this is so refreshing. I'm so glad this company is finally starting for the riders by the riders. And then boom, it just disappeared one day. I know. Well, I'm guessing that there was somebody felt threatened or I don't know. I mean, Burton bought it and then it disappeared. So mm, just it, didn't it was, cry. I, I don't know what the deal was with it, but I wish I could hear some conversations behind closed doors. I'll tell you that. I remember you guys had some ad or some like event thing that was like meet the pros, but it was like M E A T. And then you guys like, grill hot dogs for him or something it's like weird little things like that were fucking dope my favorite my favorite genius sorry sorry go on oh go ahead no i was gonna say my favorite genius ad was the one where they just straight up called out like always start with marketing before you have product <laughs> and it just basically called out the whole industry it was like marketing first put all your money into that before you've even have your first snowboard printed and then you get your technology. I just love that. It was just like, nah, that makes sense. Yeah. It was, it was basically the, the subtle art of making fun of yourself, mm -hmm. but it was brilliant marketing at the same time. So yeah, it didn't take itself too seriously and to have Peter line involved too. And when he disappeared too, I was, it was just strange. I think everybody, even me up in Canada who didn't have my ear to the ground, we just saw something weird unfolding when Peter left and Forum got sold right after. I mean, they just released one of the biggest movies ever. And yeah, it was weird. Money, yeah, money, money, money. There wasn't much community. Like I said, there was pretty much zero communication. It was just, okay, this thing's done. Good luck. You know, it was basically got a check in the mail and that was it. Yeah. Well, but when before before that time everything was you know we're gonna do this everything was pretty tight you know yeah everything was what's your ideas and when you give something all your idea you know your ideas are pretty sacred you know and you, you're giving all this your ideas on whether it's boards or uh, uh, marketing ideas and this that and the other and then to have your so-called I mean I guess it's intellectual property have your ideas being just somebody else making money off that it's just it was interesting to me it it really left a, a sour taste and then to not get up you're not you don't have the you have the balls to to basically steal from people but you don't have the balls to even give them a phone call and tell them what you're up to yeah that's the Bullshit. kind of stuff that, that keeps you awake at night and goes well who am i really getting involved with here yeah Who's they use you. It? Oh. You know? Um, I, 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 let's go to videos for a second. Cause, uh, you've had parts your whole life. Some of the best parts in, in most of the movies you've worked with. Um, and, but there's like, there's a few different kinds of rider out there. There's riders who just shut up head down and they ride. And then there's guys who are all personality and can't ride where shit. And then there's guys who have personality and can ride everything. And that is how I always classified you. Why did it take so long for you to get your own movie? The fuck? Um, well, it, I, I worked really well with the crew that I was with, you know, and, and they, they would work around my little scheduling problems, you know, like, yeah, basically if you wanted to be with standard films, you, you had to like, so, like sign in blood, you know. Like if you wanted to be one of the top guys that was getting the first slot at like going out, and they're they're gonna they're gonna waste their two cameras on you every time they go out. I mean, you had to commit, you know, not just oh I'm gonna commit to like four days and you're gonna get three shots. What are they gonna do with three shots? You're gonna have one in the montage, one in the one in the credits. I mean, you had to commit to getting two minutes of footage with these people, which was. I remember stressing out about it like this time of year. I, I'd just be stressed. I'd be like, man, how am I going to, like, one, it, like, like the danger, and two, like, is it going to be good enough? Because that that was like the cream of the crop. That was like, I mean, you're going again, like, if you wanted to film lines, you, you're going out with Johan. 
you know, it's like, well, how do I, or Tom, Dave Hatchett, or it's like, how are you going to, how do you compete with that? And then you, on the freestyle side, you know, it's like, oh, you know, in the early days, it was like Peter Lyons out there with, with Dogger. You're just like, oh my God, I'm going to, like my brain's going to explode, you know? Like these guys were just like literally gods to you and then, or Slaz. And you go, I, I caught myself like first year film was standard. I'm like, I'm out with Slaznik, dude. I'm like watching how he, <laughs> watching how he rides his snowmobile, you know? Yeah. We've got a uh, we've got a special uh, surprise for you, Kevin. We got we got Wastel here. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> what's what's up, Kurt? <laughs> well, I just got seven stitches this morning. It was pretty awesome. Yeah, let's check it. Damn, dude. Stitches? Yeah. Stupid finger I already cut off once. How'd you cut it? Did you accidentally grab Tindy? Uh, no. I <laughs> I was doing something, but I knocked over a kitchen glass. Are you sure? Me and uh, Willie were just talking yesterday that you haven't been drinking, so there's probably less holes in the wall and probably, you know, less things broken, but I guess that theory went to crap, huh? Yeah. Hey, that was a good thing. Everything else went to crap, but the drinking part was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that I was cooler when I drank. Oh, you are. We all are. Oh. I'm way cooler when I drink. That sucks. We're probably a lot funnier when we drink. <laughs> <laughs> I feel fucking boring being sober, dude. No, I feel like a so boring drinking. I feel like I'm like a like a. AA teacher. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I know you're all serious about it too. You're just like, are you do sure? I feel you want that? Better when you don't drink. All three of you guys don't drink right now, and you're you're. Uh, I'm just wondering what was my question. I just had I, something just came to mind, which is really funny. You guys all have a lot of your history is based around booze, right? Yes. A lot of your memories, your nostalgia, whether that be positive or negative. How how are things different now that you're all clean? Boring. And boring. Well, a little boring. My body doesn't hurt as bad. I got smaller pants. <laughs> the penis shrunk. <laughs> One year without a beer. Oh, I'm, I'm proud happy. of you, Kevin. I'm just slightly behind you. That's the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. I'm at like 11 months. I'm two months. Oh. Yeah, you're right there, dude. Yeah. I can so, talk at any moment. You guys at least have a little time under your belt. Let me let me ask you guys a question then. Um, could you do what you used to do, Kurt and uh, Kevin, uh, if you didn't drink? It wouldn't have happened. Really? You, 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 you're giving no. credit to the booze? Yeah. I mean, just it got, I mean, Booze gets a bad rap, but th that got me through a lot of airplane flights, a lot of just down days, a lot of, I mean, everybody's, the, yeah, booze sucks, but, I mean, there was a lot of good that came out of booze, too. Yeah, well, I, I would agree. I'm, I currently run alcohol-based festivals, uh, and I just love this stuff, but I, I also have seen people fall apart when they drink it and they never left that 18 year old, 20 year old, uh, how they acted. They just kept growing up. And then as soon as they took a sip, it was bam, right back to 20 party time. Uh, so, but I mean, that's a huge part of snowboarding. At least it was. I think so. I mean, it was, you were constantly trying to keep the, I mean, life was, awesome i mean you go out and ride and, and you it just you didn't you never wanted to stop make, like feeling good and and like nothing sucked really and you just kept it going with the party i mean it was like yeah you drink beer and for a long time it wasn't a it, it, there was no repercussions i mean you, there was no like jail time there was no nothing it was just grab a six pack on your way home and celebrate Pass out, do it again. 
Wake up, go snowboarding all day, drink six pack, wake up, go snowboarding, like, re rinse, you know, repeat. And just, it went on like that for years. And then at some point, you start, or I started using it more as like a crutch to not deal with like these industry people or relationships gone sour because of s snowboarding and because of booze or it just became something that was way too convenient to grab and make everything go away. So well, and that was kind of, wasn't that kind of, it was kind of expected at one point too. It was like partying was almost like half of the equation. Like, yeah, yeah, it's called Las Vegas trade shows. Like, yeah. what do you do? I mean, that's where all the deals went down were at three in the morning at the casino. Like, no one was writing paper at the actual trade shows. It was like, <laughs> yeah, it was weird by the time. If you didn't drink, you were kind of a coup. Yeah. Exactly. Like, if you okay. weren't in the party, you know, like, everybody was hating on Borgstead back then. Like, no, dude, the dude's at home sleeping and he's going to be up in the morning doing tricks you never even thought of, like nose press and. But he was kind of like ostracized from the group because he wasn't out partying with everybody. Yeah, that was the same with King or two. Or just... Great snowboarder and a super nice guy. It's like, in in some senses, I mean, maybe that's the racist part of snowboarding is that back then, if you weren't in like the cool clique, you kind of got, I don't know, if you weren't like. That's why the Mormons had to stick together. What's that? That's why the Mormons had to stick together, I guess. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's how the whole Salt Lake uh, City crew came up. <laughs> we need to stick together. But then when those Mormons snap, boy, they, they snap pretty good, don't they? Oh, and oh. they all snap. Hey, you guys want to try something? You guys want to try something real quick? Or are we doing an exercise? Oh, yeah. Uh-oh. The wheel of doom. Oh God! Worst snowboard trip you've ever been on. Kurt, you want to take this one? I gotta pee. Oh uh, God! Worst. Worst trip. Did you have a lot? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I can't. I guess to find like what part of it. Well, I remember. I remember having to go. I think all the all the rest of the solid dudes went to Japan and they got there like uh, maybe a week after I was already there. But I had to go with the owner of Wave Rave at the time. And I had to go like shopping for like design ideas around Tokyo. And I was like 18 and I was so bent out of shape. And then I had <laughs> uh, these like random demos all the while these other guys were riding powder and i was riding like the shittiest snow ever but then what but then once we finally met up that yeah, was really fun then it was on but i still have never ridden powder in japan of all the times i've been there really oh nope yeah never. i can't say i have either i'm a, i'm opposite every single time where were you were you on the were you in hakuba or did you go up to hokkaido uh, I can't even remember, man. It was so long ago. Saki. The Saki was good by the sounds of it. The head, the head hits. Okay, let's <laughs> give Kevin a question. No, I've been told. I don't know where this thing's supposed to be. Who's the, who's the worst team manager you've ever had? Oh, God. You don't have to answer it if you don't want. You don't have to call people out, but it's That's there. your you ass, you do. Like those team managers that you want to go on a trip, but they're like, we can't afford it, but they'll take the team out for $5,000 in sushi. Well, that happened all the time. Of course. Who's the worst at that? Okay, let's switch it then. If you, if you don't have anyone, who's the best team manager you've ever had? <laughs> well, I'd have to say Willie McMillan there at uh, Bluebird uh, Snowboards. <laughs> Got you hookers? Wasn't the, most, wasn't the most lucrative project, but he's got the couch. Those were good. Uh, those were good days, though. I mean, the hanging out with you and Kurt, dude. Those were like, I think for me, those were the highlights of snowboarding for me. Was that like year, two year stretch? That run that we got on was fucking pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah, that was that was 
The best and worst of times. Yeah, best and worst of times. But um, what about you, Kurt? I this first team manager thing because I, I, I'm trying to think of one. I know there's like a horrible one in there. I'm surprised you guys you guys don't just jump jump to one. I thought thought everyone yeah, would have that story. AJ, look at my look at my I think I'm reading your brainwaves. <laughs> <laughs> just say it guys. Just, just say it. it if just you don't like what you say, we can edit it later. This is for entertainment purposes only. Well there's 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 certain aspects to team managers where they're I think the team manager role in general, they're playing two sides of the coin. So it's like they're, they're your bro. I think they're all kind of in the same category where they're your bro, but they're the liaison between the company. So they're, they're trying to be super cool, but they're being cool to both sides. So it's like they all kind of suck, basically. They always say they're on your side. They're fighting for you. Yeah, but they're, they're kind of not, you know. But they, yeah. they kind of are at the same time. So, I mean, I don't know. They've all kind of uh, butt heads with basically all of them. Yeah. I'm sure that was a major pain in the ass. Any anytime or, they do some incentives and they tried to justify why you weren't getting it was what always pissed me off. Yeah. Like your sticker wasn't – you can't read the whole – shut up. But for me, for me, I would say uh, – Sismus, Sismus, Knox, and uh, Seda were the and best. What about Tuck? Well, yeah, Tuck, obviously, yeah. But he was more like dad, like a like a father. Yeah, yeah. What were the I, brands that those guys were working for? Well, the Knox and Sismus were Vans. Vans. And then, and Pete Derricks too, but Pete Derricks was one step above them. But those those three guys always were. I don't know. I just I just liked how they were with the snowboarders in general. Like they stood up for 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 the snowboarders way more than most. Uh, as far as dedicated to like like a career that doesn't last like one season, or if you get wrecked, then you're out. Mm. Then, <laughs> but uh, I got I, I have I, a good one. I had a that dude Enoch Harris. He. I got a story about him. I walked into Arnett one day and I was doing a deal with some other glass company. Walked in there. He gave me this huge, you know, you remember the old size boxes where you'd, you'd go into the factory and you'd grab like the hugest box they had. And it was like, you grabbed two of them and stuffed it with everything in the whole freaking factory. Walked out of there. And then the next day, like told him basically I wasn't going to ride for Arnett. And then I show up at Billabong. Like the same trips, I'd go down there and go to all my sponsors at the same time. Just one trip, get it done, so I didn't have to stay down there forever. And I show up the next day, or maybe a couple days later, and the dude had quit there, and now he was my team manager. At <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I like walk into the meeting, and he's like sitting there staring at me. I'm like, "Am I trip? Like, are we good, bro?" <laughs> like, and we kind of left it, like, at Arnett, we kind of left it like everything was good, you know? So I kind of felt bad about that, but I don't think he ever held that over my over my head. But You know what's cool is Kurt's, Kurt's repping Capita now. And we were just talking about Capita and how you were one of the one of the dudes there. You, you almost were one of the dudes there. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Still. Uh, well, the Black Snowboard of Death was my pro model, and they just took my name off it once. Uh, they actually have a board. I, I got a picture from the trade show a, couple, a few years ago. Blue sent me one in it, the, the first run, and it actually had my name on it. That's cool. Yeah, it was pretty I it was mean, pretty cool. if you're getting money for it, that's cool. I don't know. It's been it's been a while. I, I kind of feel like I let them down a little bit, but I, I don't, at the time, I just, I don't know. It just wasn't the right move, but I kind of feel like you should be on Capita again, dude. I feel yeah. like I feel like they need to just start paying you and Kurt, dude. I just love like writing millions. Things. Millions with interest. I would, I would love to see that, man. It would be so cool. Blue, why don't you send Kevin and Kurt a paycheck? 
<laughs> even though I know how gnarly it is right now for everybody. <laughs> well, you just got to get your rent paid for. I mean, that's that's for, you get your rent paid for, and you can actually spend time snowboarding. You know what I don't get? Here's the thing. What I don't get is you have all these resources. Like you have guys like uh, Kurt per se. Like you like you can take the dude to Salt Lake. He's gonna know where. where you could take put him with four young kids who don't know what they're doing from Lake Tahoe. I'm take, I mean, you have this team manager role slash like mentor slash still getting shots role, you know? Yeah. That, that is, if, if you've ever been out filming snowboarding, it's not easy. You know, you don't want to be running around on a bluebird day trying to figure out where you're going. Yeah, or, or, or learning how to build a jump or fucking any of that. Jump or, or build it wrong or yep. or not know how to ride a line correctly to where it looks good on film or I mean, there's all these, or that, you know, some angle or I mean, there's, there's all this knowledge and that these people have, these, these older snowboarders in our sport that are totally underutilized. How to be productive, yeah. How to ride a line and get a shot there's value in it it's just going through a generation gap in the future i think that's going to be you know like skateboarding went through that there's going to be you know they keep the on there there's, yeah. there's, there's value there you know there's yeah you know or just spend market these people just to speak to that the amount of times i've like gone out as an older guy who's not you know competitive anymore and just watched a crew of all the up-and-coming young pros just stare at a jump or a rail and talk about how gnarly it is and how they don't want to be the first one for like two hours. And you're like, fuck, just somebody hit this fucking thing. <laughs> like, come on. And if you had somebody there like you guys who could just be like, let me go fucking hit it. Let me show you that it's physically possible. And then you guys can start filming your shit. Let me save you two hours. Uh, that would be awesome. I think. Yeah, I like that. I, I like that idea, like the mentor sort of not team manager, but just kind of like, yeah, I don't know, just like an older dude that goes out with the crew and just like saves those kids a lot of time, you know. Well, imagine, imagine you a skateboard crew and Mark Gonzalez goes out with him. I mean, it, I mean, how much does that add? I mean, how much when I went out with Salaz and and those guys when I was getting into the scene, my my elders and Dave Downing and. My elders taught me basically everything. Yeah. So, and I was lucky enough to be able to go out with it. I wasn't just thrown out to the wind to figure everything out by myself. Kids can rip harder, but they need to know where to go and how to do it safely. Well, um, almost, you can almost see it in kid style these days. Like you can look at kids and see who they looked up to and who they had as mentors. And then you can see kids who don't have that at all. Like you got kids like Pat Moore and, Jake Blavel or I don't know, just these kids that like kind of got brought up by these older guys. And then you got kids that are like sliding under handrails at the park and doing like front flips off of the handrail and like wrapping their arms around their legs when they front flip. You know what I mean? They're like, you can tell yeah, those kids are just lost. They're just fucking you know, lost. They're doing the rollerblade tricks. Stop it. Stop it. Yeah. It's like they ran out of ideas and now they're just doing base. It looks like rollerblading to me. Like they're just like, let me sneak in 7,000 things onto this rail. And then I'm in a front flip leg tuck off of it. And that shit gets posted. That's like legit. Yeah. It's, stay, it's staying relevant. You just, it doesn't matter what you post anymore. It's just stay relevant. So you post something every day. Exactly. It doesn't matter. If you're good well, but what they should do is. Well, because that ninety percent of the shit drives me insane. So the, the app should adjust to you and yeah, yeah. <laughs> filter all that shit out for you. <laughs> Your feed would be pretty small, but it'd be yeah. You can put in all the things you don't want. Like if you can get ten tricks in in one breath of air, yeah. You just don't put it on my feed. Yeah, that's what Instagram needs. Send the message that they've been blocked. Yeah, they've been blocked. From Adam Hardingham's uh, <laughs> feed, due to excessive one footers. It's fucking awful. Some of this. And shit at the end of the day, if they're having fun, great. But why yeah. is it? Why is it being shared with the world? I guess. Well, because yeah. it's awesome, and they're a group of friends, and they all have to. They all are just struggling 
to do, uh, who knows? I don't know what they have to do to become a pro snowboarder these days. Um, well, and, then, you, and then that's the thing. Then you're contradicting yourself. If we're making fun of it in a way that's within our community, it's okay. That That's how you, you know, that's how rock climbing kind of, you know, they, they keep themselves in this little, you know, you make your own rules so it doesn't get just weird out of control. I mean, yeah. snowboarding should be like that. You know, it's like that every chance I get, I say, hey, dude, it's not a frontside indie. So true. But in yeah. the same breath, you say, hey, dude, that was a sick frontside 720 indie. But hey, man, why are rollerbladers saying that that's a 5.0? Dude, that's, that's hella whack. They're like, well, wait a minute. Well, we're, we're butchering skateboarding names, too. So, you know, it's like, keep it tight. Keep it. Don't be hypocritical. If these kids yeah. want to do that. That's fine. And, and it's super fun. But don't make it, you know, keep don't it tight. Don't film it. Don't film it. <laughs> Don't make me look at that shit. And a lot of that's just a generation gap, too. We didn't have 15 cameras every time we went out. You had one. Yeah. Some dude was carrying the camera. He's not going to waste it on your, you know. We'd still be dorking off doing all this dumb stuff, but you didn't have cameras documenting it and posting it out for everybody to see. Don't you think, like, with half pipe riding, they need to kick it back 1 180? Like, the way that they call tricks like you're hitting it at such a fucking angle that you're losing so you know what i mean they call oh, it yeah. a front side seven but it's a five yeah yeah and it's barely a five you know what i mean it's like if you really cut that up into a pie like you're just adding on 180 to everything or it's maybe almost that 360. like vert skating you're not really hitting it at that much of an angle you know it's more like up and down i mean there is alley-oops and there's like yeah, are we lot. talking about degrees here? Yeah, I'm yeah. talking about like in half pipe snowboarding, you know, it's like a front side three is a front side five. I'm like, you landed, you took off forward and you landed forward. That's a three. Don't call it a five. And then well, everything has an extra add, They should add yeah. them all up and then, then at the end, you, you would have what it equals, right? So if you go up at this angle and you do a 180, but it's actually a little bit more than a 180, it's like a 215. So then at the end of the pipe, they would add it all up as opposed to saying. Yeah. And they're like, his whole run was a whatever that well, number. It's, it's, a 17, so, it's so fucking technical. Why not? Why not do it? With tons of frontside indies. Yeah. Yeah. Or boot grabs or just, I don't know. But dude, that shit's gnarly, man. Like, how do you like to be a fucking competitive half pipe rider right now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. that shit gives me anxiety just watching that shit, dude. It's, it's, so, heavy. it's so heavy, man. It's so heavy. Kurt and Kevin attached to the industry. You guys still, uh, you still got a finger or toe dipped in there? In the industry? Yeah. I got a like a, a pinky toe. I what got that. I got my hands in the dirt. Yeah. What are you, you What are you doing right now, Kurt? Yeah, where are you at, Kurt? What are you doing? Tell the Tell the listeners. Freaking night. Uh, I'm I'm. Right now, I'm just up at my parents' house. Not this very moment. I mean, like in snowboarding. Are you? Oh. Uh, are you still connected? Well, I mean, with Willie and um, like Blue and Vans gives me stuff. I mean that's about it. I mean it, that's it's that's like a bonus that keeps me into it. Because otherwise, there's no way I would be able to to, to pull it off. Well, yeah. and you're like you're like breeding a fucking super shredder right now. How's that like taking your? How's that taking van snowboarding? Um, I, it's I'm so, I, I just had to just I just had to go for it and get passes this year at Bear. Yeah, he's already looking good on a snowboard, man. Yeah, but the rad the raddest thing is somehow the marketing director at Bear, I guess, saw that I was there and he like messaged me. I was like, no way, that's cool. So oh, that's rad. Like you kind of forget about that stuff, and then and then you that makes you feel pretty good, I guess, when you hear those kinds of things, you know. Yeah. yeah. In Canada, they don't know that snowboarders even exist. <laughs> You have to go every year for 20 years and bring all of your magazines from the previous year in just to 
prove to them that you can have a day ticket. What about you, Andrew? Magazines in. Are you? Are you? What about you, Andrew? Are you involved? You get free shit. What are you doing? No, I. I mean, I was a personality rider anyway. I don't think anyone ever thought I was that great of a snowboarder. So there's. I still get. I still get like. Well, I I knew I was okay. You're but one I still of the get sunglasses. And... I know, dude. <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? Stuntman. Yeah, but gnarly. She was the gnarliest nice. snowboarder on the least amount of snow ever yeah. in the history of all snowboarding. Yeah, he yeah. And, and he was taking his own photo with a remote. That's so, awesome. That's fucking. And bad. there was no apron of snow. The apron was not like a street. Yeah. yeah exactly. Thank you. I'm so oh, okay. I'm so glad someone saw it. No. I didn't think it saw the light of day half the time. No, it did. We we're paying attention. And when you when you're from Banff, uh, and sorry to this isn't this interview isn't about me, but when you're from Banff, and maybe you guys can speak to this too. If you're not from the Hollywood area, you're on your own, pretty much. Maybe there's someone listening out there, but you. I, I remember I was on the side of a highway. Uh, that was my safety, as I could crawl to a highway if something happened. And uh, I had a camera set up of stills and I had a video camera set up uh, and I walked to the top and would just <laughs> just try to hit radio slaves. And I hooked up wireless mic so I knew the camera was going and uh, it was great. Yeah, it was like you and, and uh, Mike Bassett. You guys were the original. Well, he was, not me. I, he was I mean, here in front. I learned that's pretty me. sick though. Like you get... Theoretically, you get paid as a writer and then you sell your photo to the mag. Like, that's fucking genius if you can pull that off. I think I made more money off selling photos than being the snowboarder in the photo. So that was nice. What is happening there, Kevin? I need yeah, to chop. Well, I think it puts its lotion on its skin. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you sent me. Skin. You sent me the straight out of lotion, straight out of Compton logo with uh, Buffalo Bill there one time a few years ago. Oh man, yeah. I just, I just, I must have masturbated to that photo like a hundred times. <laughs> you think nobody remembers Hardingham? <laughs> I'm honored. What are you still doing in the industry, Kevin? Like, what is? Do you do you have a? Are you are you stirring a spoon or anything? Well, you know, there's, there's some product that comes in the mail, and 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 uh, you do realize quite quickly how expensive snowboarding is when when stuff stops coming in the mail and the checks stop coming. I mean, it's a it is a very expensive sport. Absolutely. Did you stockpile? No, not even. When you not saw even. the the end, not the finish line, line, did you put four boards away and eighteen pairs of goggles? I sold everything. I keep, I, the, dream, the dream just kept going. Like as long as I had some product, I could ride for like another month or something, you know. So but uh, yeah, it's it's never. It's like the stupidest question I think that I ever get asked. If people are like, "Hey, dude, you still snowboard?" Like, yeah, like as much as I can when I'm not pouring concrete and raising kids, and it's like, yeah, I want to be snowboarding every day. You know, I, I it's like. It just, that question baffles me, and it's, I mean, pretty much daily when I'm in that environment, you know, with snowboarding people. Yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, I snowboard as much as I can, just like everybody else. So that, like, do you just not because you're not in videos anymore? You, you just okay, I'm done. I mean, it's not football. You don't just like stop going to the. Oh, I'm not going to Super Bowl. I'm never picking up a football again. You I know? don't know. There's people like that though, dude. That people. I know. That ain't me. Yeah, it's just that they never loved it, you know? Yeah, that's always baffled me as people who just, like, never snowboard again. I was snowboarding yesterday. <laughs> it's only two and a half feet of snow. So, yeah. <laughs> you just pick your battles, I guess. You're solar-powered a little bit more these days. You got to choose yeah. the things you want to call turkey. Yeah. Well, you yeah. always have Snowboarding's not one of them. <laughs> You have that, you know, it never shuts off for me. It's like you have that thing like, oh, I could come, you know, I could come back. I'm feeling pretty good this year. My knees are feeling good. My back. You have that thing where you're like, I could go do that. Yeah. So that that's that still hasn't gone away. It's just a matter of figuring out the logistics and how you could pull it off. And so what are, are you? Oh, sorry. Are, you're living like uh, you said you're living just right outside of Boreal right now. 
Yeah, about 30 miles from Boreal. And you got like a, you got a good crew. You've been, you've been shredding with Roan and, and uh, what's that other guy's name? Uh, uh, Roan has been ghosting me a little bit so far this year. The, the season's only been in action for like a week, so he's but got wait, time to read. So. Weren't you telling me you were like building fences with Roan? Yeah, I was, I've been, he's been giving me some work since my like, other job kind of got shut down with the whole COVID thing. Does anybody like, have you ever showed up to a house and somebody's like, holy fuck, it's Kevin Jones and Roan Rogers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this last project was with uh, this guy, Shane, who who runs the Arbor House in, in Truckee, and, and his daughter came out. He goes, my parents can't believe that you're making a fence, that you and Roan are making a fence in our backyard. That's so it's rad. cute. Yeah, that's like, it was cute. That's like Kurt rolling up to your house and installing a sprinkler system and tearing your whole yard apart and then turning it into a piece of art by the end of the day. Yeah. Gosh. I mean, you're good at one thing. You're probably going to be good at doing other things in life, you know? It's, Kurt, it's crazy how fast it seems like you get those projects done. Like, um, it was you, you post a photo of the yard just like completely ripped up and then like five minutes later, the thing just looks so fucking sick. <laughs> well, yeah, on time constraints because I see my child every other weekend. So I, I have no choice. I mean, fame and snowboarding was a totally different thing back when Japan actually li liked us and didn't want to or did want to be us. Now they're way ahead of the game. But uh Kevin, what was it like? How did you handle fame and like what was your yeah, what was your interpretation of it? Because it was brand new to snowboarders right when you were in the mix. There wasn't fame in snowboarding before that. Uh it, it's it, I, I it was annoying to me. Uh, it, it's cool for like a couple months or maybe like a season. Cause at first you're kind of like, yeah, that's kind of cool if people notice me. But then after that it got, it just kind of got annoying. It was just, you, you kind of, you didn't want to, you didn't want to be in character all the time. There was, it, people kind of expected you to be like drunk, funny guy or, um, or at least that's how you thought that they expected you, mm -hmm. how they expected you, you wanted to, you know what I mean? Like they wanted, Absolutely. in my brain, I thought they wanted me to be something and you kind of just wanted to shut it off and like, the, the worst, I remember when I was dating Tara and Mammoth, we would have to like put on full on hoods and face masks to go into the bonds or we'd have to stay there all night. And then the, the catch 22 is if you didn't sit and talk to people, then you're an asshole. And then, I don't know, just kind of a trip, you know, like I didn't so, really like the, whole, the, the fame. I, I feel sorry for people that are super famous and, and. I mean, not sorry for him, like, oh, like, I stay awake and I think about it, but it's not, like, it's, it's not as cool as what people, like, everybody wants to be famous, like, screw it, that. Until like, they're famous. Like, yeah. And, and once, you're, once you're famous, you can't be unfamous, like, you can't unsuck a dick, you know? <laughs> it's like, if you got famous for something whack, you know, like if you shit your pants at, on TV or, or like you just fucked up super bad and you were famous because of that and you got no money out of it and you were just famous, like that's a fucking nightmare. It's like the worst case scenario ever. Yeah, but there's elements of admiration in fame, especially when it's talent from an athletic point of view. You were better than a lot of other people or you had the best video parts, so it's a compliment. But I understand you felt like you had to be turned on at all points of time. You had to be yelling and, and la the loud guy. And that just didn't fly with you because why? Well, I, I, I think that there's two parts of it too. There, there's that part of it, or there's more parts. To it. it could be a long conversation because there are parts that are cool. Like when somebody kind of comes over with respect and says, Hey man, you're the, which happens more often than still than, than I expect it to wrong word but you know what i mean yeah There's i know what you're saying. that you don't even know you've never met he's got your boots on or something or some old board or maybe he doesn't and and he says hey man you're the reason i moved to tahoe it changed my life thank you like just something so cool and you're like whoa you, i mean that's a positive effect to have on somebody so the positive part of it's cool 
So yeah. I guess I kind of retract my last statement that it, that it's annoying. That part of it's cool when people come from respect, but you get that, that with that comes the people that are like, hey, dude, yeah, dude, you ever snow anymore, man? Or you get, you know, some dude like, yeah, dude, how old were you? Like 60 when you did that triple backflip? It's like, like, the, like the, that constantly kind of poking or thinking you're something subhuman. It's like, no, dude, I'm just a dude who went off a jump a few times and, you know, everybody else made it something that it really wasn't. But I, I was just this dude who was like snowboarding all the time. <laughs> yeah, or they're trying to play that stupid pro game at the bar and dump a drink on your head or some shit. Yeah, just trying to piss you off. Or I remember when Tara was in Banff one night and we went up to this bar and some dude just dumped a drink on her head because that was like what he he's now the coolest guy in his dipshit friendship circle, you know? I was like, yeah. what, what are you doing? There's well, that I mean, I too. It comes with the territory, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Did we... We didn't start snowboarding to become famous. We didn't start snowboarding to make money. We didn't. That wasn't part of the plan back we, then. There was, we there did was it no to plan. bang girls. Totally. <laughs> that worked out super well, too. You're like, hey, you want to come back to my garage that's like minus 30 degrees right now? It's killer in there. <laughs> Snuggle up in my, my plus 10 bag that hasn't been washed since December. What's that smell? I uh, see too. the kids. They're just like snap their fingers. I got a Nike Red Bull shirt on. I need to get a, a Red Bull sponsorship for like 180 grand a year. I had a snooze contract one time that Willie got me. Oh, uh, well, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, we got we squeezed some money out of them really quick, and then it was I over. I paid for like, my whole season. That was like a uh, that was like a one month deal. That was crazy. We pulled like time. We pulled like thirty thousand dollars out of General Snooze, and then it was just over. They just were like, "Make us these three shitty videos," and we literally timed it how much time we would put into the video. So like when we we're editing, we we're like, "We're gonna give this this video seven minutes," and once the timer went off, we're like, "It's done," and we sent it. To them. <laughs> And they were like, oh, this is sick. And they took it. And we got we all got paid and went to Alaska that year. And then it was just over. It was so weird. Were but they that's like creative. Like they couldn't, they, they well, couldn't market the children anymore? So snowboarding, the demographic was wrong? No, they were about to pass this bill that said that like tobacco companies couldn't advertise on like any kind of sports anymore. Like like NASCAR or snowboards or fucking anything race cars so they, general snooze was trying to get their dick in the snowboard vagina before it closed and somehow we got linked up with them and i was like yeah i got i can probably get kevin and dow and your skids i can't remember who else i thought we had three people easiest snowboard money you ever made was it this no it was reebok reebok yeah. What was that all about? It was me and Temple. And they came to us. They said, hey, here's here's 10 grand to not write any, not sign a contract because we think we're going to make boots next year. They gave us 10 grand. Never even got a, like a sample boot. Never had a, I don't think there was ever an ad. There might have been an, like a maybe an ad or something. Never did it, never had to go to like a trip, never had to go to the factory, never had to go, never did anything for this 10 grand. Just to just no show up. It was just a months. holding deal. Yeah. Yeah, holding deal. For one yeah. month. What about you, Kurt? What was the easiest snowboard money you've ever made? Probably like that, the Xbox game. Yeah, the Ant, mm -hmm. Ant or something. And it was barely any. Oh. Because I wasn't the main star. How much are we talking? Five grand. Did you get? Did you get any like? I have a game that was like a platinum game. Did they put like your sponsors logos on your character's board and stuff? I think so. Did you get money from your sponsors from that? No. Dude, that's insane. Because nowadays, if you're on like Tony Hawk, dude, you're fucking. You better be. You better have a pool at your house, dude. Lamborghini rich. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. like those those kids are getting paid so much, dude. It's fucking rad. No, I just have a video game to show my little grom. That's cool. So he's, he's, 
and we get annoyed as hell when my voice tells Matt disses him on a jump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you have like an Xbox that's like compatible with that game still? I do, and it's sitting right in my room right now. So you can just pop it in there. Well, I just I don't know where my original controllers are, so I'm kind of screwed in that. They're all sticky. Do your do your guys' yeah. kids know like that you guys were like fucking rock stars ten years ago? Or I mean, I still think you guys are rock stars, but like, do your kids know what? Like, do they understand like what you do and what you what you used to do? I think so. I think my daughter's starting to figure it out. She's uh, she's old enough now that, and she loves snowboarding. So I think she kind of she's kind of got it figured out. We're figuring it out. How old is How old is your daughter? She's thirteen. Oh, okay. How's that? How's having a teenage daughter? It's heavy. Is she just like, hug me, leave me alone? I'm cold. I'm hungry. Come yeah, here. she's hey. she's she's pretty <laughs> chill. She she. I'm stoked for her. She's she's kind of, she's got a good head on her shoulders. She's not all weird drama out yet, but you know the the tough parts to come. You know the next four years is going to be heavy. But does she have uh, boyfriends yet? Or are you like hanging out with a shotgun at the front door? I I clean my shotgun nightly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what's uh what's what's she into? Like what's she all about? She's snowboarding and skateboarding, cool. and she's. She's got the tomboy gene. Rad. Hell yeah. Sure. Yeah, she's on, at five years old. She did Skyliner up at Mount Bachelor from top to bottom. So she definitely has the. And, and I don't care if she's. I mean, I don't really care if she snowboards, but it's rad that she does, you know? It's yeah. Rad that she, she's into it. I'm trying to beat my record for a lot of four days. No, six days in a season, two seasons, two seasons ago. Oh shit! Yeah, that's just that ain't good. So I'm at two right now, so I'm doing pretty good. Oh, that's you're cool. ahead of her. Yeah, I'm way ahead. Let's go it's shred Big Bear or something. Could yeah. be here in like seven and a half hours. Yeah. The last time Willie came to Canada, he got the Rona. So there that's go. true. So I think we're wrapping up here. Thank yeah, let's you. Wrap this bitch up. Thank hey, um, you, Kevin, uh, so much for joining us and letting us uh, uh, quiz you. Kurt, as well, thanks for joining us halfway through. Let's let's have you guys on again and uh, fucking love you guys. Love you too, Andrew. I don't want to exclude you. I love you too. I love all you guys. Let's let's close this out with... Uh, Hi, I'm Mark Carter. Hi, I'm Kevin Jones. We're here to talk to you about my new all-temp barbecue sauce, Wax. But no, slicker shit out of the bowl. Ribs and jibs. You. For ultimate penetration, apply generously and baste thoroughly. Once you've applied generously, let it marinate for about 15 minutes. Then put the grill to it. I won't be so barbecue. I won't be so barbecue. Mark Carter's barbecue sauce, all temp wax. Even smells like barbecue sauce. Mark Carter's barbecue sauce, all temp wax. Smells so good you want to eat it. No! <laughs>